Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Interact Global, uh, the free virtual edition of Nomensa's Interact Conference. Um, big thanks to uh, Rui Koto of OutSystems for his talk earlier on bridging the gap between academia uh, and the design industry. Um, and coming up later today at 3 p.m. UK time, we're joined by Bern Irizarry of Sony Pictures with her talk, How to Manage Transitions Creatively. In this talk, she'll explore leading change in challenging times, examine change management models, and show how, as a creative leader, she has incorporated change management into both her creative practice and her life. Um, it's still time to sign up, so head over to our Eventbrite page if you haven't done so already. Um, up now, though, we've got Nomensa's creative director, Chris Richards, with his talk, The Style of Experience Design. Part academic and part inspirational, Chris will walk us through some key movements in design, art and tech that will help us think differently when designing experiences by adding a style to our process. As always, uh, say hello to each other in the chat, um, join in the discussion, um, just make sure your chat settings are switched to panellists and attendees and that way everyone can see your messages. Um, and if there's any issues with the stream or anything like that, please do let us know there too and we'll get that sorted as soon as we can. Um, also, please submit your questions using the Q&A function. Um, I will run through as many as I can uh, with Chris at the end. Um, finally, uh, we're using auto-generated captions. Some of these might not be 100% accurate. Um, however, when we share these talks publicly, uh, we will ensure uh, they are all correct. Um, so yeah, over to you, Chris. Cool, thanks for that introduction, Henry. Yeah, so the style of experience design, this was quite an interesting uh, project to work on for you guys because it's quite a fun space trying to uh, look at how advanced we are getting now within this industry, uh, the internet's ever expanding. So there's lots of processes that we work with every day and that goes across the full spectrum of UX understanding, design understanding, and technology understanding. So what I really wanted to do with this talk was kind of uh, potentially broaden the mind uh, somewhat to, to look at how style can kind of come in to, to make sure that we focus on as much as form as we do function. So in my day-to-day -day practice, I understand and appreciate styles as much as I can conceptually. So I'm involved pretty much from the start of the concept, through pitching, through all the way into, as we go into iterative design and eventually into final deliverable. And that could be across many omni-channel experiences, focus a lot on app design, web design, into social forms of illustration, animation. So. I definitely uh, help steer more of that creative side, but when I'm thinking about styles. And in my personal work, I've selected a few personal works here, uh, a little bit more Halloween-y because it's the season of the witch or the beast, so to speak. And I wanted to show how style has always been a part of my life. So whether I'm inspired by particular movements or particular ways of doing things. So I'm always ever challenging myself and I wanted to talk about how we could take some of this more creative idea and put this into our day-to-day -day practice. So my talking points really is I wanna add an introduction and add some context behind what I mean by style. Second part, I want us to kind of think about style for competitive advantage in our practice. And third one, I just want to think about some style for the future, some kind of cool developments that we're on the brink of and how we can think about and get excited about what, what's coming up. So let's just lay down some kind of key principles to start off with. So we're all, I imagine everybody on this call is super familiar with design as being an objective and being factored by solution constraints and product. So I, what I refer to design in this talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about UX as well as uh, UI design. So by us being designers, we are we providing a service to our clients and a product to our clients. So there's lots of millions of factors that we need to, to consider in order to create a product that's appropriate for the audience. And then we have technology, you know, very rational, you know, design being objective, tech being rational. And it's driven by the need of convenience to improve the way that we live within our lives. And that's getting better and better, more self-aware as we go. So that kind of relationship between design and technology is amazingly close now. But I kind of want to step back a little bit and I want to talk about where art sits in this spectrum. So art, as we all know, compared to design, is subjective and it's very personal. It's very much inspired by emotion, the human condition. And this particular 
painting here by Caspar David Frederick, apologies if I mispronounce any names throughout this talk, is rich with metaphor. It's, it's the wanderer above the sea in the fog and it's classed as a romanticist style of painting. And I'd like you to sort of step back and think a little bit about the experience that the viewer would have engaged with when they, when they first saw this painting. And what we are doing is we're, is we're standing back, we're behind the figure, we're not focusing on the figure, we're looking at what that figure's experience in this huge vista it's, before him is a world of imagination possibly adventure and it very much reminds me of how we experience computer games today where all, I almost feel like I could control that character I could jump down and I could run through into this romantic world of adventures in front of me and that's that's what I personally take from the style of this so how can we kind of take that and and bring it into our day-to-day -day practices so we take design we take tech and then we add in art. That's how we start to think about style. Style is the glue that brings those three disciplines together. And style is defined a particular of doing or saying something, it refers to a unique form of clothing, a way of arranging your appearance. But more importantly, as an example, a style is my method by which we learn. So I want to take a little bit of a step back from digital and I want to look at some key architectural movements. So I want to open up with the international style. This is coined, kind of coined slightly. Uh, I'm not going to go into Bauhaus because I'm sure we're all familiar with Bauhaus, but Philip Johnson and Henry Russell Hitchcock really kind of pioneered what we refer to as the international style, which some may refer to as modern. And it's for me, it's utilitarianism at its finest. It was characterized by emphasis on volume over mass, use of lightweight recyclable but industrial materials. It was a rejection of ornament and color and it used modular repetitive forms. And also the technology had advanced to a point where glass was in much better form of mass production. So light was really important as well. And it really kind of created an impact wave to sort of give the world an impression of what progressive vision of the future looked like. And if we compare that to the architectural movements that were before this, for example, Art Deco. It is quite interesting to look at the rationale behind this particular style. Okay, it wasn't as practical as the international style because it required a lot more time and materials to create something as unique as this. And Art Deco is really kind of focused on a symmetrical, geometric, streamlined, pleasing on the eye. It challenged viewers to kind of find their own meaning and beauty for it. The Chrysler is, very iconic now in the New York skyline. I think a lot of it features in cinema. Uh, I can already see Predator and Spider-Man sitting on the side of one of those eagles that's poking out. But for me, when I look at the Art Deco style of the Chrysler, I like to look at how the spikes at the top that segment up look like the sun rising and at night they also light up. So it creates a very kind of visceral experience to me and I, and I take from, what it, from that what I need compare it to two of my other favorite built architectural buildings in New York. And that's the General Electric building that you see in the center there. And what was kind of amazing about this sort of uh, deco style is it, it used a bit of uh, Gothic revival in there as well. But when we look at the, the facade, what's called the crown at the top, that's meant to symbolize the electric waves of electricity. It kind of really empowers this building and what this building's about. And it's absolutely incredible. It kind of almost stands still in time as looking old and new and also focusing on the radiator building as well which is pretty amazing using black brick uh, that's meant to represent coal and the gold that's meant to represent the warmth and it's quite interesting there was an architectural decision with the black that was going against the idea of referring to what they called waffles of windows so all of the buildings looking the same with these waffly windows by having the building black itself kind of uh, add less emphasis on the window and made the viewer, a viewer observe the rest of the architectural decisions. Before Art Deco, we had Art Nouveau. And Art Nouveau was kind of very much inspired by organic uh, nature. And it was very bespoke, like the old English building here in Brussels, we could see at the top center, had lots of rich filigree, lots of design. There wasn't one part of Art Nouveau that wasn't particularly um, considered to be standard everything was different every building gave a unique experience one of my favorite uh, possibly more gothic nouveau 
uh, buildings in in uh, Amsterdam, the Pafé Theatre. And I can remember this struck me when I walked down one of their grid, I'm not particularly sure which grid district, district line it was on, but I can remember stopping because it, it looked like it was something out of a Tim Burton film. There is a one piece of this building that isn't kind of considered and uh, really entertaining and enjoyable to look at. So the issue with the international style is this quote here, really, what's wrong with it is the international style is precisely what the name declares. It's a style that's detached from any specific place, a nowhere style using nowhere materials that are incapable of reflecting the indigenous life and landscape of where it's deployed. And I think that's a really good point because there are lots of pros about the international style that I'll talk about later, but as a negative, it does kind of have an impact. And it reminded me a little bit because I'm fortunate enough to live through pre and post uh, smartphone revolution. But it reminded me of a time that we were designing before we had to think so much about modular design after 2007. And we were creating very rich bespoke experiences utilizing now archaic software such as Flash. And it wasn't necessarily right, it wasn't uh, accessible, and sometimes they were kind of, it was classed as designing for designers as opposed to designing for users, so it had lots of negatives, but there was a sense of positive behind it because it, it gave each product and brand a sense of identity that was beyond the types of identities that you see that it manifest in branding such as uh, logos, fonts, colours. It, it worked deeper than that. It was about adding depth. It's about adding new movement. It was about changing the way that the observer or the viewer experimented with their online experience. And where we are now after the smartphone is we, we have to, we have to focus so much on function that we've kind of forgotten a little bit of the form. Whereas before we focused more on form and we didn't really respect the fun function. So now we're in a world of modular, uh, design systematic thinking we're thinking about things at such a programmatic level that we need to make sure that we have time to think about the style that transcends this modular utilitarian approach so what about art what key kind of movements in art took a similar stand so the Italian futurists were a, a controversial but interesting bunch of people. Uh, they deliberately rejected, again, similar, they rejected the idea of anything old and they wanted to be, they wanted to be inspired by this idea of the futuristic city, inspired by speed cars, uh, very dynamic architecture. And if we look at some of the artworks that they created, like this one in particular, now still feels like it could have been produced a week ago it's its composition is incredible for many reasons uh not only is it dynamic but it also they've decided to reject the grass and they've made it like hues of blue so there's lots of things going on here that seem kind of ultra futuristic considering how old it was and just to put that into perspective when we look at the 1800s the let one of the kind of late realist paintings here compared to uh, on the right more of the dynamic futurist paintings there's a roughly a, approximately around 20 years between that and that's that kind of goes to show how kind of forward thinking the futurists were and they wanted to create this style to pull it to make sure that there was this big change which then if we go back to the architecture metaphor here and we look at some more of the deconstructivism that came out with the uh, the disney theater now technology has progressed to the point where we're able to create these much richer architectural experiences. The same with how the organic architecture movement's working at the moment. It's more symbiotic with its relationship. It takes products and materials that work for both the environment and the person that dwells or utilizes this space. And this really is where we could, we could kind of start to appreciate where we came from and to where we wanna go. And to put that into a key takeaway to, to kind of really define what I'm trying to say here is these styles consider a deeper meaning than the international style, but they're very much built on the form and the systematic thinking and the progressive advancements in technology that the international style offered us. So let's just bring it back into our kind of ballpark a little bit more and talk about some classic kind of digital design experiences that utilize style. And it's super cliche, but really easy for me to use Apple for the purposes of my uh, talk here. So when we think about Apple, we think of an amazing onboarding process where we've taken a whole generation of people and we've, met, and we've 
there's an accessible device that they can use. So we talk a lot about putting the user in mind. We talk a lot about certain processes that they've taken and sort of testing. And we think about the user experience of how impactful Apple was. But we don't necessarily talk too much about the styles that influenced it. So there may or may not be some people here familiar with Dieter Ram's functionalist style. But when we compare his transmitter radio that came out in 1958 compared to the 2001 product design for the iPod, you can see here clearly how some of those, his style has influenced in Apple helping them to create this very premium feeling product, the style of it only really giving the user the types of functionality that they need. And you can compare this a little bit with more Android based phones where they do give the user the option to completely take it apart and customize it. Apple have decided, you know, depending on where you sit on the fence that it, the user doesn't need to concern themselves with that. They've got this, they've got this type product, this functions product, we're only giving them what they need to do. And it's very much, a, you can see here that where that influence has come from. And for me, one of my heroes, Mazamo, clearly inspired my deck design, has very strong typographic influences using a minimalist design with color and basic form and type. And what I've done is I've added a recent above the line campaign for Apple's privacy. And you can clearly see there how that style influence has come through. And finally, we're looking at Paul Rand here. Paul Rand is a very infamous graphic designer. He created the IBM as one of many uh, visual identities. He kind of coined what was referred to as the jewel at the time, but it was the symbol that sat next to the text of the logo. And he worked with Steve Jobs on the next digital branding, which I haven't got in here, but he's more famous for the, the IBM work. And you can see how some of that style has come through in some of Apple's most famous above the line campaigns. And I've added those in here as well, just to share it within a mood board concepts, how they work together. There's a clear uh, style influence through the playful nature of Paul Rand's graphic design work to the fact that he used an I and a B to symbolize <laughs> IBM. Is that cheeky play on using graphic design to convey uh, a, a deeper meaning and an engagement with the user? So if we wrap all those up together, we take design, we take tech, we take art, we refer to design as the mind, tech as the body, and art as the soul. You combine that together and that, that is the style of Apple, all of those influences that work together. So part two really is thinking about style for competitive advantage in practice. So this slide's quite key here, this tri-diagram. Tri where we focus so much on day-to-day -day within design and our UX thinking, we're masters and experts at this. And we also are acutely aware of advancements in technology as well. I've got some slides to kind of go over some of those in a minute, but it's really important to make sure that once we add this third art back into the equation, and in the middle, we create style, then without that extra consideration for these movements and to think bigger, we can apply our style. That's the missing link for me. So just to kind of like go over some of those, let's just talk about design in the mind. So we have to understand user needs. We have to stand, understand business needs. We have to understand wayfinding, AI, IA. We have to understand the systematic design as well. And if we compare that to what was great about the international style, was the international style from an architectural perspective, emph emphasis on volume over mass. They were utilizing industrial materials and mass produced materials, setting a sense of conformity. So when a user walked into a building or a person walked into a building, if they've been in one skyscraper, they've been in two skyscrapers and it's the same style. When they go in the third skyscraper, they're going to know what's going on there. So there was a learned behavior that started to come through with this and that helped more with the idea of the modular forms. So you can see where the relationship between design and architecture from that perspective, and they are more of the pros of how of what the international style helped set a standard. When we think about tech as well, we're thinking about designing experiences for omnichannel across smart devices. We're thinking about app builds, whether it's native, hybrid, progressive, cross-platform. We're never defined on which one's the best way to go because technology is always developing. We have APIs now, we can pull content in from elsewhere and we can create bespoke experience on, on certain pages. We have Web Builder, we're all familiar with. 
we have social platforms now and now looking at Gen Z and how they operate with social platforms, it's a whole different uh, spectrum. It's, it's a talk in itself. But let's think about what's coming. You know, when, when we think about the steps of the industrial revolution, when we're moving now into this final step, where we're looking at wearables, we're looking at voice, we have AR, VR, mixed realities, we've got faster processes, more intelligent processes that are going to help us work better with AI. We have faster connectivity. We're able to access the internet wherever we are in the world, and that's getting faster and better. We have biometrics. We're using our physical DNA to help use a, help alleviate potential security issues and activation with our with our actual bodies, it's pretty amazing. We have blockchain and algorithm. So there's so much stuff that's coming out now that we that should be inspiring us to think a little bit about uh, how we how we work in our day to day. So when we look at art now, like now, I, I hope you're convinced that between design and tech, we're fine. We've got that covered. We're experts in it. So how would how do we add some more of this art and how do we kind of how are we influenced by that? How should we think about adding it? And I think one of the two really good examples is the fashion and the, the automotive industry, how they consider style when they're doing their works. And this is one of my favorite fashion designers, Iris, Iris Van Harpen. And if we look at the middle figure here, which is Grimes. Uh, she was working with Iris to be for the Met Gala. She was inspired by June, the film that's coming out. So they wanted to have quite a futuristic looking dress. And you can argue that one of the issues with the high end fashion is that it's not practical. You, you know, a lot of fashion models are built in a particular way that makes that level of retail a little bit difficult. But if we look at the examples on the right here, this is also from Iris's retail line. You can see clearly how some of those influences from the futuristic impression of where we want to go with fashion has now led its way through to more of a commercial output. So that dress there, clearly you can see the spikes that have been uh, inspired by it. And with the, the single dresses set at the top, you see the flow of particular, uh, that, that type of material with gradient flow through it. So you can see how fashion dictates, and high-end fashion dictates an idea for the future and retail rolls it out. And her work is pretty amazing. It's, it's art in itself. Uh, you're, she's able to kind of really challenge what she perceives future fashion to look like. It's very ornate, it's very sci-fi. And it, it, for me, it feels like it borrows a lot of the influence from how the futurists really approach their work as well. Um, looking at things that were very non-conventional and making them work in this stylistic way. And also thinking here about mixing the medium. So she was very aware of 3D printing, for example, and did a whole show runner where she created bodies of work that utilize 3D printers. So similar to the international style, thinking about now the progression in technology. Now, what can we do now? Now we've now we've hit this bar. How can we use new medium to create new uh, fashion experiences? And I thought it ha I'd have to mention the, the Kardashian Matt, Met Gallery, Met Gala, sorry, uh, dress as well. The, for me, uh, the idea, this kind of timeless style of black on black, but what's interesting is a lot of the base of this dress is, is a kind of fusion between high-end sportswear and fashion. And if we compare here, this particular design in the middle, a company called Acronym, which are focused on the idea of fashion style that comes through with ultra performance. Um, so it's the idea of, of not only are we getting closer with technology now, but we're also kind of getting closer with the way that we dress to improve the way that we live. And I, I really like having the, the Rihanna dress there, the black on black, almost going back to a, an older uh, style versus the traditional um, Japanese education way. You can see how these kind of two influences come together, created something that still feels ultra modern. So the key takeaway here really is high end fashion shows a style of the future and the retail adds this practical element based off the vision. So what about automotive? When we talk about concept cars, 
So I think this is a really interesting concept car because a concept car creates essentially, it's not something that will go to market, it creates the basic DNA for what's to come. And this particular Rolls Royce here, hopefully now I've given you guys some, some kind of like examples, you can see some of the Art Deco influences that come out. So not only is it an ultra modern car that's kind of been designed to think about not necessarily driving, but sitting in it with the future of automation on the, on the horizon, it still borrows some of these kind of like key movements in art that give it this this style between ultra futuristic and still kind of inspired by older movements and when we think about concept cars now we don't necessarily like i mentioned before think about the driving experience but think about the social experience of how we would what type of car that we would get you know do we is there such thing as a one person driving a four person five person so many cool ideas come out thinking about the the car manufacturers are thinking about this now you know, even though we are still releasing cars that are focused on a single driver because the tech, the, you know, the, the implementation is not there yet. And just to kind of give an example of how far we've gone, this Citroen came out in 1996. If we compare one of the latest Citroens that's come out in 2021, it already looks pretty futuristic, right? Um, you can see some of the influences that have come through with some of those wider styles we're talking about today, but the idea of kind of aerodynamic versus kind of style, it feels, it's not okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it, it's not flying around, we were, maybe we were expecting to fly around by now, but it's still kind of, uh, it still feels ultra futuristic from where we've been since, since the 90s to now. So the key takeaway there is really car manufacturers in, it's very important to do conceptual design, concept design. So it provides the basic DNA for the cars to come. So what does this mean for us? And the way that we do it here at Nomenza is quite a simple thing, really. And it's informing the, the client, this is how we want to do it, getting them to buy into it. So it's important to do vision setting. And I know when we uh, perhaps create concepts uh, to, in order to procure work through pitches, it's slightly different to that. So with our traditional process at Nomensa, we would go through a discovery phase. And I'm not going to go into all of the, the types of exercise because we tend to cut the cloth depending on what the client's needs and budget are. But, you know, ideally, discovery kind of understands the core needs of the product so that we're all on the same page and we, we're providing the best product possible. And then we tend to jump into an iterative design and test phase so that the solutions that have come out of that are appropriate. And then eventually we kind of go into a system repo or design system or however we want to refer to it because that idea is constantly changing as well. But it's really important, we believe, to have in the middle the space for the vision. So what the vision does is it, is it, cre it creates a, an environment where we can be inspired by the wider world and we're allowed to say that what we're doing at the moment is obsolete. You know, which which can seem quite like maybe devil's advocate or counterproductive. But if we've created that environment where we're free to do that, then that creates that flips that argument on its head. And we want to make room and it's our kind of responsibility really with the ever progressive developments in technology to make sure that we are suiting the needs for the future user. And we might not necessarily make some of this might not go into the MVP. But it could certainly become, a, there, there certainly will be elements of it that would get into that iterative design phase. So for me, that's that's injecting some of that R in the middle there. That's not jumping straight to international style. That's not going, I know how this particular component works because I've tested it. It's making sure that we're still challenging that. So another thing that's kind of based on that point really is to think agnostically with style. So we know that hardware and software is going to get better. Just to give you two examples, uh, Amazon Astro is about to kind of hit the market and that's going to be our first, well, it might not be the first, but it's probably one of the first uh, major known brands that are doing a robot in the house, a domesticated robot. I'll let you guys research into exactly what it does, but it is essentially uh, the, first, the first of this relationship with robots, which is pretty cool. And they also have the, the Amazon Echo, which is not as grand as a robot, but what it what this technology provides are touch points that you can put around your house. So suddenly we're in a we're in a world where we have a generation that have grown up with devices that understand touch and gesture, that we're able to create terminals and we're able to connect. So what's easy is 
to not get run away with the idea of having your concept be just based on ever progressive technology style needs to step back from that and it needs to kind of cover the spectrum agnostically so the last step in this one really is to is to kind of know the distinctions between timeless principles and trends and i find is when i talk to my team it's it's really important to to look back because a timeless trend such as futurism uh, is is, be, is, is, a, is a more futuristic way of looking at where we want to go, right? And I've got an example here with, with cubism. So cubism is quite a divisive, uh, a divisive part of, of, of expressionism, really, because what it tried to do was it was quite clever. It, it wants to challenge different viewpoints at the same point of time. So you created a free, dimen a, a free dimensional landscape on a, on, a, on, a, on a 2D canvas, right? So if you are working by these, by these rules, that's when you end up creating some of these quite interesting, unique styles, like the Picasso there, where the eye is on the wrong way around. It's because he's forced to pull that eye forward. So he's, he's challenging his perception of depth and reality. And for me, that feels like it's a space that we're going to be going into relatively soon for like head up display. So I've created, up, I've created this pretty quick concept here, but thinking about what a Google experience would look like with a halo lens headset on. And I feel almost like I'm walking in the steps of how the cubist artists were thinking, like they've got a new kind of medium of an, and an identity of space here that they're playing with. We need to think about the interactions with this extra dimensional space. So that kind of idea um, certainly helps kind of think, make me think about things in a slightly different way. It makes me think about how a, a viewer might have looked at a cubist painting and taken from it certain aspects and angles that you wouldn't have necessarily thought about if you weren't forced to take that practice forward. And for me, that kind of came in when I was thinking about how we might be designing experiences with headsets in the future. So again, we have to work with this, this new dimensional space. And the last one, a little bit more low key, uh, with, is the illustration branding actually for this talk. It's a little bit of a meta example, but when I was coming up with the illustration style for this, I was looking back at some of the Alice Vinsky and we were also talking about Picasso and more of that kind of cubist movement. But I wanted to try and create something that wasn't just uh, a, a, an obvious depiction of what the future looked like, because it is confusing and it is kind of chaotic and exciting. So I first started off creating all of the individual shapes, forms of technology and software and hand itself hopefully has different meaning. It could mean someone's sort of interacting perhaps with 3D objects in a virtual reality space, or it could mean that we're reaching through this chaos to try and find the light. And that was what the final piece looked like. But it didn't just stop there. I wanted to make sure that we didn't just have this one image. I was actually went back to the international style as well, thinking about that modular form and how sustainable this could be, making sure that it worked with different colors. So that it meant that every year we do this talk, we were able to take crops from this one master image and create unique shapes and styles that sit within the different social platforms. So it still has this sense of ambiguity to it. It still makes you look at the image and think, what is that? It kind of, and it, it feels like it's representative for this new emerging technology and this new world that we're living in. So we're the final part now, and I just kind of want to leave you guys with some, some ideas and some concepts that have come through. Some of them are stuff that I've done to, to try and bring the idea to life. And some of it is, is are new releases that are coming out. So we can think about our style and go look at digital design, tech and art. So with digital design, we're in a really interesting space now. And any, any of you uh, sort of Google material fans out there will probably like where this is going. Well, they might not actually, it might freak you out. But the new material design is actually called Material U and it's declarative design. And it's all about uh, creating a system that enables the user to create their own style and their, their own identity. And it's been released for us through the new Android 12, which is probably an easy way to uh, kind of get this concept across. For those that are old enough to remember, for me, it feels like the MySpace time when we were able to kind of design our own MySpace. Uh, but it's very much a world where all of these components are designed to be accessible, et cetera, but the user is dictating how they want their world to look like, how they want their browser experience to look like. And if we partner that with 
again, a generation that have grown up with iPhones and tablets and they're used to gesture and touch. Like my kids don't know what a laptop is, for example. It's already technically an obsolete piece of technology when you look at where we're going with the advancements in hardware. This particular uh, piece of technology here is called the magic mirror, where the viewer is able to look at their clothes and then they can have a deeper relationship with the product that they're looking at there. They can find out what technology is made, it, if it's sustainable, if it's environmentally friendly, if it causes particular ir irritation to their skin. They're able to figure all this out and have a much deeper experience. They might not even buy it then, because it might be out of stock, but they could still buy it through the mirror and just have it ordered to them. So there's lots of ways where this technology, this touch and gesture technology is kind of coming into our home. And that's echoed a little bit with the uh, Amazon example that I gave you earlier of the little terminals. So what would Google look like then, you know, if we took this declarative design approach and we took this idea of these Echo tablets that would be kind of put around the house? This is, this is the standard, lovely, beautiful, minimalistic impression of the Google homepage today. But what if I wasn't like that? What if I declared it to look like this? I wanted it all to be black. I wanted to have all of my apps synchronized in. I wanted it to tell me what technology, smart devices is connected to, what the weather is, what the music's playing. And I've changed my little voice to a pixelated face because that's what I want. Or what if I didn't want the face and I wanted just a big time and I wanted to add this organic kind of crazy cool vaporwave background. I can do that. So suddenly Google looks crazy different search results page for example when we're looking at particular night trainers here we have the little rich card that that starts in the corner and it gives us that richer detail about the product but perhaps now with this particular style this individual's declared it completely changes that experience the rich card now becomes a hero area at the top is interactive it's almost what we're pulling the content of the website forward into the browser it's connected to my apps i can quick buy shows me where my nearest store is geolocated I can see similar products or I can go through to the official website. But it, 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 I'm kind of declaring my style and declaring what I want. So it's a, it's a different way of Googling. Everybody's going to have a unique Google browser experience. It's pretty cool. The tech is ambient now. It's the term ambient is pretty mental as well. I think you know, a lot of us grew up with the idea of having manual, you know, typing things in looking at things like gesture, navigation beyond that manual point. We have voice, we assume, we assume we will, some of you may already, but we'll be designing experiences where we don't think about UI at all, it's just all conversational. Biometrics, like our cyborgs elements starting to come out, our relationship with our DNA and our, and our uh, products. And light as well, I'm sure you guys have seen lots of stuff with light where it's, all, it's like less hardware, the idea of having a desk with your two monitors, your big old Dell monitor, then your MacBook with your keyboard, but just kind of uh, having light to, to, to stimulate and change things. It's, it's a crazy way of experiencing our day-to-day -day lives. It's very exciting. And just to kind of focus in a little bit on our reality, you know, we've got VR, AR, MR. So virtual reality being a space in which we completely go into, and that's crazy at the moment as well. There are lots of, um, there are lots of products where people spend a lot of their time in a virtual world now. They don't necessarily want to interact physically. They want to exist in a completely virtual space. And I was kind of disappointed that the PS5 didn't focus more on, on this advancement in VR technology. Pokemon Go is great for, for AR, putting a virtual object in a real world bit of view. And then mixed reality is essentially that both of those where you'd have a door, but you walk through the door and it'd be completely virtual. There's been some amazing advancements in the medical industry with mixed reality where surgeons are able to look at a particular complicated surgery, go through, go through a, a virtual reality version of that and see if it perhaps my edge their bets in the right way to go. Wearables as well. Uh, pretty cool thinking about that idea of, of cyborgism, you know, connecting where we, we have the Google glasses that came out in 2012 and we have halo lens that's being worked on at the moment. Then we also have clothing as well, going back to some of those fashion ideas that we looked at earlier, being able to perhaps more focused on survival mechanics or, for, or first responders, being able to uh, inform the user how the jacket might be too hot or too cold depending on what survival situation they're in but you can see how this would eventually become urbanized 
we have the idea of watches now. Obviously, I imagine a lot of you guys that are watching probably have some kind of uh, smart watch, whether it's a Fitbit or whether it's a, an iPhone watch, or iPhone watch, an iWatch. But the idea of being able to kind of contactlessly pay, you know, pick up a load of stuff and just walk out the door, and as you walk through certain terminals, it pays for it. There's no need for a till. It's kind of interesting things like that when we're thinking about wearables. And finally, sports and and sports and um, health coming through with those smart trainers so the purpose of, of me talking about this is that it's there's such an expanse of amazing technology coming through that that style is really important because we need to to use that as the glue to bring this bring this kind of new way together and lastly to think a little bit about art you know art is beyond physical now and it's probably the craziest of all of it if we look at where we're going people tend to visit places and experience like AR art experiences. So it's not necessarily going to this particular uh, bay to go on the big wheel, but you're going there to see the artwork, to, to, to experience that virtual artwork. And people grow up with this and it's, it's what they love doing, it's crazy. And we think about modern ways of expressing ourselves, you know, memes are now quite a, I mean, I'm probably more millennial, but, there's there's a set theme now especially gen z kind of they express themselves through memes you could argue that memes are a, a contemporary form of expressionism and we have non-fungible tokens the way that we sell and we publish art now through cryptocurrencies is mad it, it's it's pretty cool so just to kind of wrap that that talk up then so the style of experience so style as long as we do it right allows us to think bigger about our processes. Hopefully I've inspired you, made you want to go back and look at some architectural movements, look at some art movements, look at how automotive industry use concept cars and fashion uses high-end fashion to dictate future visions. So that allows us to change in a positive way. If we think about adding that vision setting earlier between discovery and, and rollout, then we can kind of create an environment where we're all talking at the same level and we're all bringing to the table some really cool ways of developing to think about that style and finally style allows us to design for the future so that's me uh chris i have two other talks uh one's really creative it's focused on uh how to how to design uh, in lockdown so it seems a bit irrelevant now but some of the uh, techniques and processes if you're more interested in my artwork they put up at the front and the second talk it goes a lot more in detail about the progressive technology that I've touched on today, and that's called the evolution of convenience. So they're both uh, available via YouTube. Cool, thanks. Awesome, cheers, Chris. Yeah, love that. I mean, it's fascinating to see the relationship with art and design and tech, and and yeah, I loved your uh, mind, body, and soul analogy. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I can see one already in the Q and A box. Please do submit them for Chris now, um, and I'll run through them. Um, so Chris, at, at the start, kind of you, you showed a few of your um, your passion projects, um, which which yeah, I love the the Halloween theme, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'll put that in there. Uh, is there like like is a clear kind of style to kind of the art you produce? Like how how important do you think it is for designers to kind of have these passion projects? Um, and kind of does that help you in your role, kind of bring that into kind of the client focused or kind of more functional work that you do? Yeah, it definitely it definitely has influence in my more commercial work. I think one of the the, the difficult aspects of uh, style for designers is that we're really good at being chameleons. We're able to kind of under we're able to take on, especially in digital contexts, because primarily we're not involved in the branding. So we we are kind of chameleons, and we take on uh, different styles to kind of create the final product. But then there's more of this kind of artistic calling to us as well, where we want to try to create something unique. So when I look at my work, I see it as lowbrow pop culture. I like to blend genres and I don't feel like I have a unique style for my personal work. So it's something that I feel as the older I get, the more I want to work on that, you know, um, and but in terms of looking at replicating other styles to understand the methodology behind that, I think it's really important. And the only way to do it is, as you say, by a passion project, really. You need to be super, you need to look at styles and think, I really want to understand how that works so I can I can figure it out. And then you can you can put it through into your personal work as well. And you need to look at some of the stuff that I've shown today. It might be crazy, chaotic, and overwhelming because you've already got hundred and other one other things to worry about when we just focus on our core 
design solutions now you now you're asking me to like think about this crazy technology and these mental uh style movements but you should be like super excited about that um and think about uh create and that's why it's important to create that sp safe space where you can uh, have these types of conversations brilliant thank you um cool yeah we've kept couple of questions that have been submitted. Um, so first of all, Chris, uh, do you have a favorite art style or, or architectural style? Yeah, so I, architectural, I've always, I've been a bit of a sucker for uh, the deconstructivism style. Uh, I, I do like the way that it really creates a unique piece, like a building is more than just a function uh, depending on the content content of the building right and the, the that disney example that i gave there is really nice um so yeah and, and i'm really inspired i think where the organic style is going as well fusing lots of kind of asian influences in with more of the scandinavian influences and and how they're very aware of japan is very aware of space because it's a small place to live they have to be extremely creative with how they utilize new homes so everything feels a little bit more bespoke and considered and that's the same with um, Scandinavia as well, being very kind of understanding and appreciative of the nature around them. So I do quite like that. In terms of um, more artistic styles, uh, I, I used an example in the talk for, for Cubism, and I'm not necessarily a massive fan objectively, uh, subjectively, sorry, of Cubism, but I do want to try and replicate and understand how to do things like that it would be really fun to take a medium and an object and force myself to think about how i work with dimensional space so i respect fully what they were doing um, more than necessarily some of the particular final renders but the idea behind it is really important so I, it's kind of a respect from that side of things thank you um so we've got one more question here. Um, we have got time for a few more if anyone does want to uh, send them in. Um, but yeah, we've got one here from Joseph. So Joseph says, uh, it does feel like design is more and more constrained with modern UX principles, mm. like Jacob's Law, for example, um, or trying to make designs more accessible for users feels like it limits what can be done. Um, have you got any comments on that? Yeah, man, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. And uh, I guess I'm a little bit of a black sheep within the business, right? Because we are, we, what we do is very considered from that perspective, you know, and that's kind of where clients come to us for that. So when you when you chuck creative direction in there, um, I, uh, I, I I'm very aware of these limitations, and I respect where they come from. But there is definitely an interesting aspect on how we need to think about. The, the way technology is evolving to to alleviate some of those restrictive concerns you know when it comes to accessibility with voice uh where we come where it comes to particularly long formulaic sign-on processes like the addition of biometrics you know the technology is always going to be progressing that should make that a little bit easier as well but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd be lying if I said people don't check me all the time um, when it comes to things like that, because it is important that we still create a product. So, yeah, sorry. Um, I hope I answered that question. I thought rambled a little bit at the end. <laughs> well, I, I suppose you can kind of argue that, I mean, kind of true creativity comes from having constraints, I suppose. So. Yeah, and that's kind of why I wanted to open up the presentation with, you know, it's design as a service, as an objective from that perspective. You know, we're employed to design a product based on a brief, but it's important that we could still, we still need to make sure that what, what I'm trying to say here is style allows us to have that conversation and it allows us to think about not so much that international style of the modular, you know, it helps us think a little bit more about maybe taking a step back. Now we're confident in uh, adapting to responsive fluid layouts. And we think a little bit more systematically when we take on Brad Frost's atomic design principles. I think that um, we, you know, we, we still need to push, we need to push and I'm hoping that technology is gonna be a way to, to get around that as well. Absolutely. Um, cool. Uh, I think that's it for questions. Um, lots of great feedback in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, nice to cool. read. 
some of uh, the art movements and um, and bring them into today's world i can see in there um so yeah no thank you chris yeah that's that an awesome presentation um Wicked. thank you to everyone else that tuned in um as uh i mentioned yesterday we are hiring here at namensa um so yeah we're looking for both permanent and freelance professionals kind of of all levels in ux and design so yeah if you want to come work with chris um, yeah come work with me <laughs> check out namensa.com forward slash careers or drop us an email at hello at namensa for more information um up next we have burn erizari at 3 p.m. UK time, so just over an hour. Um, hopefully, see you all back then. Um, there is still to sign up for that. There's still time to sign up for that. Um, so yeah, do so if uh, if you haven't done so already. Um, cool. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Cheers. <laughs>